it's good good to be here. Um, you know, I, I hail from Mississippi, and you know, if you're from any other state, you can be thankful for Mississippi because we're always first or last in everything, and neither is good. Okay, so that that that's just where we are down there. But um, uh, you know, I drove up here yesterday and and got a little shocked because it's. It's sort of like driving back into winter from down there. We've been pretty warm, and we've had an extremely mild winter down there, basically no winter at all. And uh, last week it was so warm, one of my buddies was out fishing, and, and they were biting really well, and so well that he ran out of bait, but he didn't want to get off the water. You know, he wanted to continue to fish, so he started looking around and seeing what he could find to fish with. And he, and he saw this old water moccasin up near the shore with a frog in his mouth. So he slipped up on that water moccasin in his boat and he, and he reached behind his head and grabbed him. He, he, you know, he was thinking, well, he can't bite me with that frog in his mouth. So he grabbed the water moccasin and, and pulled him up. He yanked that frog out of his mouth and put that frog in his bait bucket, but then here he was holding the snake, and he said, uh-oh, now how am I going to let him go without him biting me? So he looked down at his feet, and he had a bottle of Jack Daniels sitting there. So he took the bottle of Jack Daniels, and he poured some down the snake's throat, and that old snake's eyes rolled back in his head, and he went limp, and he, he just released him then. And so he grabbed that frog out of the bait bucket, put it on his hook, and commenced to fishing. And, uh, and, and after a while, he, he felt this nudge at his feet, and he looked down, and there was that snake with two more frogs. <laughs> so, uh, so sometimes, you know, doing something different just takes the right incentive. You know, that's what it's all about. But uh, go to the next, please. Okay, what I want to start off with today is talking about uh, the soil. You know, the soil is really the foundation for everything. It's the foundation for our life, for the life of plants, for the life of animals. And, and so, you know, I like to start with this slide just showing the soil food web and saying the soil is alive, okay? Now, if we look at what an acre of healthy soil should look like, okay, this is it. In terms of bacteria, we should have over 2,600 pounds of bacteria in an acre of healthy soil. If we look at actinobacteria, over 1,300 pounds, and you know, this is a type of uh, filamentous bacteria, and uh, you know, I remember from my childhood, uh, I'm sixth generation from the family farm. We've been there since 1842, and you know, I remember in my childhood especially, and it's a, you notice this a lot less today, but when we would plow the soil and all of this, you know, you would get that distinct aroma. And that's the type of bacteria that, that creates that aroma. Okay, fungi, 2,600 pounds. Look down here, earthworms, 445 pounds. That's what we should have in an acre of healthy soil. And then insects and, and other arthropods on or near the soil surface, 830 pounds. Okay. So that's an incredible amount of life that we should be seeing per every acre of healthy soil. Now let's talk about what soil microorganisms do. Okay. What is their job, their role, their function? First of all, they decompose organic compounds, and this includes decomposition of manure, plant residue, pesticides, and it prevents them from entering our water system and becoming pollutants. They sequester nitrogen and other nutrients. Okay? They fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, and of course, making it available to the plant. They enhance soil aggregation and porosity, thereby increasing infiltration and reducing runoff, and they prey on crop pests and, and their food for above ground animals. Okay? So what's the food source for the soil microorganisms themselves? Okay, well the food source is other living organisms including other microorganisms. Okay, they prey on each other. Uh, dead plant and animal material the active fraction organic matter, and this is the portion of the organic matter that is most readily available for the microorganisms as a food source. Labile organic matter, which again is, a, is an organic matter that can, be, that can be decomposed quite readily. Okay, root exudates, and that includes plant sugars, amino acids, and other compounds from the root. Uh, particulate organic matter, and this is basically a form of active fraction organic matter that has definable size and weight. Okay, Lignans, we all know what lignans are. 
uh, and of course fungi feed very readily on lignans. Recalcitrant organic matter, which is organic matter that is much harder to decompose, and this is made up of the lignans and humus, and of course the humus. Okay? Now, where do they live? Where do they reside? Okay? The vast majority reside in the top few inches of the soil. Next slide. But some have been found as, as deep as 10 miles. Okay? The vast majority, though, exist around the root zone in the rhizosphere. Okay? And if we take a look at the rhizosphere there, it's literally teeming or should be teeming with life. Okay, we're going to see all kinds of bacteria there, and then we're going to see all, a whole host of other microorganisms that actually graze on the bacteria. Okay, so that, that's what we should be seeing in that root zone. They exist in the plant litter on humus, in the surface of soil aggreg aggregates, and the spaces between those soil aggregates. Now, what are the benefits of a healthy, complex soil food web? First of all, we get enhanced nutrient cycling, increased nutrient retention, improved structure, infiltration, and water holding capacity of our soil, disease suppression, degradation of pollutants, and greatly improved biodiversity. Now, this is an example of what happens when you have very active soil microbial populations. And this goes back to that acre of healthy soil chart that I put up earlier. Okay, what are you looking at here directly on the surface of the soil? Anybody know? Those are worm castings. Okay, isn't that incredible? Now, those are worm castings. And, and this is where we've been very successful at being able to restore soil microorganism activity in populations. We start, the wor earthworms come back, all the, the insects, arthropods come back, and we start to see this kind of activity. Next. And this is one spadeful directly below those castings. Okay, we stuck a spade down in there, pulled one spadeful up, and that's the earthworms that we brought up that were below those castings. By the way, that was in the middle of a field in July. Okay, in Mississippi. That was not, uh, you know, under shade or something like that. Okay? All right, now if we look at what we've done over the last several decades, we've been pretty successful at mining out the minerals in the top strata or so of soil. And if we look at NRCS soil pedon data, we can see that, you know, we have done just that, uh, but we still have some really good mineral stores deeper down in the strata, okay, that we can tap. The question is, how do we tap them, and how do we bring them up to help remineralize, you know, the top several inches of soil? We also want to be able to obviously improve our soil organic matter because we know, as evidence from this table, that for every percent increase in soil organic matter, we get a very significant increase in water holding capacity. Uh, you know, in, in Mississippi, our, you know, we've been farming there you know, as a whole for over 200 years now since people started moving in and farming there. And our average organic matter is, is barely 1%. Okay, so that means that for every rainfall that we get, we can, our ground can really only absorb less than 20% of that rainfall before it starts running off. But if you get up to 8% organic matter, your ground can absorb 85% of a rainfall before it starts running off. Yes? To what do I attribute the loss of organic matter to? Yeah. Well, it, it's a number of things. We, uh, you know, erosion is obviously one. You know, from past cultivation practices and so forth. So that that's quite obvious. Uh, and, and especially in our part of the country where we have periods of the year with very high rainfall and so forth. Uh, but also, you know, a, a lot of our farming practices where we have basically. Uh, 
you know, we, we've dramatically lowered that soil microbial population. So we don't have that activity. And if you look at, if you remember the, the, the sec or the first real table I put up where what a healthy acre of soil looks like, you know, if you have that kind of population, you're building continuously very, very good organic matter and, and maintaining that, not just maintaining, but building. So, okay, now, one of the, there, there's several things that we've looked at over the last 20 years in, in our research and then uh, in 2000 I left academia and went full time back into uh, private uh, consulting practice and farming and ranching with my partners and uh, we, we've looked at several things in the U.S. And, and some other countries on this but uh, we've looked at uh, uh, you know various cover crops particularly cocktails of cover crops and have had some very good results with that. We have looked at combining cocktail cover crops with livestock impact and had excellent success on that. Uh, that's a whole other seminar there though, but, uh, but what I want to concentrate today on is we've also been looking at, over the last two to three years pretty heavily, we've been looking at actual infusion of soil microbes in very high concentration back into the soil to give us almost an immediate impact. Okay, uh, and so what I'm going to spend the rest of my time on is, is going through a, a few results. I've got a lot more than this, but just a few results and talking about the commonalities, okay, the common things that we are seeing in terms of response to dramatic increase in soil microbial population. So we're, we've been using a, pro, a product formulated that has a generic name of Sumagro. It was developed by scientists at Michigan State University and they hold the patents, but uh, it, it's a unique patented combination of over 30 different microbes in a concentration of 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14. So you've got over a trillion microbes per milliliter, okay, is what it amounts to. So when you apply it at the recommended rate, you're getting, uh, you know, several trillion microbes per acre applied. It is sourced from naturally isolated soil microbes, they're maintained in pure parental strains. Here's some of the microbe classes that are in this particular formulation. The major function groups of microbes that, are, that we've been working with and looking at, we have <coughs> nitrogen fixing microbes, phosphate solubilizers, uh, nutrient cyclers, plant phytohormone stimulators, and then microbes that act as biological control agents. They are maintained in a liquid humate carrier at a pH of 7.0 uh, and that's their food source until they are applied to the soil. Okay, now I want to quickly define this because this is one of the important things that variables that we've been measuring in our trials and our research and that is BRICS. How many people in here have heard, of, heard the term BRICS before? Okay, wow. You know, usually I don't get anywhere near that many hands, but uh, BRICS is simply a measure of dissolved plant solids, sugars, minerals, amino acids, proteins, lipids, pectins, that type of thing. Next. It's measured with a refractometer, very simple instrument that's easy to use in the field. Next. This is a scale, easy to read, uh, where the blue field and white field meet is where you take your reading a percentage of BRICS. And BRICS has been extensively used for decades in the fruit and vegetable industry. Uh, you know, it's quite a common practice there. And in the wine industry, it's been an invaluable tool. We're just now sort of pioneering the use of BRICS and forages and row crops and this type of thing to measure nutrient density in our, in our crops and in our forages. Last year, we did some trials with the soil micro products in uh, 14 different states that encompassed every major production region of the U.S. And I'm going to just dive right in. We, we, have, we don't have very long now. I'm going to dive right into some stuff and just again try to hit the common results. So I'm not going to cover everything. This was a corn trial in Nebraska. We had the microbes with 100% fertilizer, microbes with reduced, and then the control was 100% fertilizer. So every time I say control, that's standard fertilization practice. Okay, that's what the control will be. Okay, the two things I really want to point out here and that are common across all crops that we've worked with, we've done, 
row crops, fruit and vegetable, and forage crops, we see a in significant increase in bricks, significant increase in root development. Okay? Uh, you know, we, we use way wagons when we did our row crops. You know, we test, test weight, moisture, all of that. In this particular trial, we did not have any significant difference in yield between the treatments, but because of the fertilizer reduction in the microbe treatment, we had a $47 per acre advantage there. Okay, in a soybean trial in Nebraska, again, increase in bricks, increase in tap root length, increase in root nodule development. Uh, in Illinois, another corn trial. Next. We had a 17 and a 32 percent increase from rep. Yes. When were the BRICS levels taken? When did you take the, the, the BRICS levels were taken throughout development, okay, uh, almost all the way to harvest. So, so we have BRICS levels that were taken basically from, uh, we started at about, on corn about 18 inches and moved up from there. In the soybeans, we started basically at the V2 to the v, V3 stage and moved up from there. Okay, so we, we were doing cereal bricks on the plant on the leaf material, okay, all the way through development. Okay. Uh, next. Okay, in Arkansas, looking at cotton, we did the microbes with a 50% reduction in fertilizer, then the control. Okay, we saw again a significant increase in bricks. Next. Significant increase in bowls, uh, tap root length. Nope, not yet. Go back. I'm sorry. Okay, and one of the things that we notice in terms of biological control, okay, is in the conventionally fertilized or the control, we averaged 1.2 bowls per plant that exhibited bowl rot, and we couldn't find any bowl rot at all on the micro-treated cotton. Next. Okay, uh, and again, a significant increase in yield at the end. Next. In North Carolina, we did another cotton trial. We, this was challenged with a hurricane followed two weeks later by a hailstorm. Okay? So we had some significant challenges to this and you need to know that to understand the results on the next slide. Okay? Uh, again, we had a significant increase in yield on the micro versus the control, but the real difference was in the value of the cotton per pound. The microbe treated cotton withstood the challenge of the hurricane and the hailstorm much more readily and came through that and produced a normal, not an exceptional, but a normal cotton crop for that area. The control did not come through nearly as well and the quality of the cotton was discount, was so poor that it was discounted 40 cent. Okay? So that's what we saw there. Watermelon trial, again with reduced fertilizer and the microbe treatment, in this, again, significant bricks increase, uh, significant yield increases through three harvest. Okay? And then uh, Arise Research and Discovery here in Illinois did a trial for us looking at the evaluation of the use of the microbes for reduction of water runoff and nitrate leaching in corn. Okay? And we did a micro plus 50%, micro plus 100% fertilizer, and then the control. These are the containment bays. Next. One more. And then these are the results. If you look at runoff with the microbe treatments, the SG100 and SG50, we had anywhere from a 47 to a 57 percent decrease in water runoff. Okay. And then in terms of nitrate leaching, anywhere from a 35 to a 57 percent decrease or reduction in nitrate runoff. Okay. In yields, we had a 19 to 22 percent increase, significant increase in chlorophyll, and a significant increase in microbial activity. Okay, and we're running up against time. Let, let's bump to my summary slide here. All right, so what were the common things that we saw then in using the microbes? Uh, and the same has been noted for our other practices that we've utilized to increase that soil microbial population. We've noticed significant increases in root length and mass, an increase in bricks, and whenever we see an increase in bricks, we see a definite increase in plant health. And if you go back and you look at all the peer-reviewed data from the fruit and vegetable industry, you know, they've been saying this for decades, and their data has been showing this for quite a while. 
So, and it's the same in any plant. So increase bricks, increase plant health. It just goes hand in hand. Reduce water runoff, reduce nitrate leaching, yield increases, and enhance stress tolerance. And that's climatic disease and pests. So those are the common themes that we saw in the use of microbes. Um, I welcome any questions. How are you applying this? It's being applied uh, for most applications, most crops, uh, row crops, fruits, vegetables, and forages. We're making the first application either pre-plant, plant, or emergence for the first application, or in the case of perennial crops, forage crops, that kind of thing, at green up. Okay? And then doing a second application approximately four to six weeks later as it fits into standard production practices. It can be co the micros can be co-applied with herbicides and with fertilizer, so you can, you can mix and co-apply. Um, the only thing that, that we have found you know, that you can't do, you don't want to mix them with fungicides, okay? uh, because you kill some of, the, some of the microbes in the formula. But, uh, but that, that's the standard practices. There are specific recommendations for each crop, but, but those are the standard production practices.